Today's episode is sponsored by Future State Media, experts in off Amazon traffic for Amazon sellers. Future State Media will build you a custom made website to deliver sales for you on Amazon. Built to grab traffic from search engines and social media, your site can be used as a secret weapon for launching products on Amazon or just to stabilize your Amazon sales. It means you can also build an email list on autopilot. Go to futurestatemedia.com for your free guide to Google SEO for Amazon sellers today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. This is Michael Vesey of the 10K Collective, and I'm going to be delighted to welcome Aaron O'Sullivan of Systems Culture Impact to the show. Um, Aaron deals with outsourcing, which is a very important thing for people who are wanting to go from a certain level where you still got stuck, and um, you can even get find your revenue going backwards if you're focusing on the wrong things. And at that point, you definitely need to be thinking about outsourcing. So Aaron, welcome to the show, a very important topic. Hey, Michael, thanks so much for having me on board. Uh, really excited about today's session. Yeah, my pleasure. Good to have you back. And uh, it's an important topic, as we said, for, for people who are growing and got the growing pains and it can actually become a real barrier. So tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all, your, your background personally or as an Amazon seller as well. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, a little bit of background is I started in 2013 selling um, our own brands, private label brands uh, on Amazon and things started to go really good. And, you know, I was like a kid in a candy shop, started launching new products and opening up new marketplaces and, uh, you know, went a bit crazy. In 2014, because I had so much on my plate, you know, the brand started to take a bit of a, a plateau and then a bit of a dive. And I was freaking out. I kind of didn't know what to do. And, um, you know, it took me a while to kind of join the dots, but you need systems and you need team in place for you to continue to grow. And um, that really came to me that insight came to me through working with some large teams and helping build some large teams in the philippines and um you know it was my job to build all the systems and processes and, and kind of nurture a, a team culture to drive uh forward you know 10 or so brands so that was um how i got my kind of start in systems and, and team and and implementing uh them to get things off people's plates and uh yeah we just we just been working with seven figure sellers helping them get the operations off the plate so they can focus on profit generation things like inventory management customer service and bookkeeping so um that's kind of where we're at where we're at today excellent so uh, i guess it's like a lot of the, the best businesses you start off by scratching your own itch or to put it another way you're your own first customer because you've got a problem you learn to solve it and then realize that you're not the only person with that problem so i think it's a good hint whether you're starting out just um, creating your own amazon products or indeed creating a service it's the same thing right it's, it's just always good to really uh, be answering a real need rather than it's coming up with something off the top of your head so very reassuring that you've been there and done it yourself so obviously you know from first-hand experience so Tell me then the first question, which is not just the naive question it sounds like. Do we actually really need to outsource? I mean, the other day in one of the masterminds we run, we had somebody who's doing, uh, you know, at least 1.2 million pounds a year or something like that, probably quite a bit more in good years. And he's just him and his, his business partner. Um, they haven't actually got a VA at all. It's not because they don't know they exist or haven't worked with them, but they haven't felt the need for it. So is it something we really need? Right. So... Um, it's a great question. I, it comes up often, um, but I think the answer is usually pretty simple. You know, if you are doing everything yourself, it's going to be holding you back from focus on the profit generation activities that enable you to to grow your business to a place where you can, you know, take more time off. You can, you know, create the legacy that you want to create in the world, whether it's just helping your family, whether it's building. Um, a movement around your products and brands that are going to change all of you know, a lot of customers' lives. But if you do not outsource, and it's going to prevent you from doing that. And frankly, I think if you don't grow a team, it's going to be one of the most um, lonely, challenging um, endeavors that you ever go you know forth with. Um, you know, it's kind of like any 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 successful sports team has a real you know solid team behind it, and you know that is the same. Um, you know, with any business, any successful business that, you know, that we all remember, all the most, um, you know, legendary business people that you've ever heard of always had a solid team around them. So, um, you know, you're going to reach the capacity at which you can continue to grow your business because you are maxed out with all of the operations, all of the day-to-day, -day, all of the firefighting. So, um, you know, my uh, answer is kind of absolute. It's, you know, you, you will 100% need a team in place. Um, you don't have to start there. You can start with just outsourcing parts of 
a process or parts of a system. You can get people per minute these days. So, uh, you know, you don't have to go and, oh, I have to employ somebody and, you know, have a big office. And all. You can just start with the process, uh, one thing that you want to get off your plate. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where I would start Excellent. hiring processes out, um, contractors, and then, um, you know, move into hiring uh, a team which is full-time for you. Okay, so yeah, that's you made a very valid point. So one of the reasons people question it is probably because the question they're asking in their mind is, do I need to outsource an entire role or whole higher, um, you know, a full time person or outsource a ton of stuff and create this whole team? And your answer is, well, yeah, you, you should outsource, but that doesn't mean you've got to hire full time. You could just be you know, micro hiring. And that's a very, yeah, it's very wise because I think that if you make the barrier to entry for something too big, people just never do it. And um, for the newbies to the market, it's like, let's go from nothing to one private label product in one go, which is why I try and always encourage people to, to, to try things out on a small level. And I guess for more established sellers, it's the same thing. If you're moving into outsourcing first time, you don't just go full time. So that's a very good point. So the next question that comes up is at what point then should we start outsourcing? Because um, is it when you're just doing tiny numbers, your, your business can't really handle any extra overhead um, but uh, there comes a point where there's that balance between the overhead addition versus your time and growing the business in the future mm -hmm. what would you say is that kind of point where you need to start outsourcing so as we mentioned you can start hiring out particular parts of a process um, I think it's really important to, to immediately you know as your business as you start to get some sales and starts to get some revenue uh, come in what things that you ultimately um, don't like to do are not good at or you can outsource um, for way less than your um, potential hourly rent rate that you bring to the business in value. So um, I believe we should start outsourcing, you know, as soon as you start generating some revenue, start, you know, um, bringing some money into the business, you will be able to understand the things that you're spending time on, whether it's a personal thing, whether it's, you know, hiring a cleaner so you don't have to spend two hours a week cleaning your house or whether it's, um, you know, going to Amazon, you know, we're all in the Amazon space. Um, if you haven't got your, most of your stuff automated on Amazon in terms of, you know, uh, products that you need delivered your house, that's a, you know, a quick and easy win you can get going with to free up some time. But, um, you know, it could be, it could be anything from, you know, um, having a cleaner come around your house or whether it's, in offloading part of your customer service or part of your uh, inventory management, um, really, there's there's no time too early. As long as you're you've got a product and you know you're um, bringing in some revenue, you can afford to start outsourcing a you know a process or you know a part time person. They don't have to be uh, full time. They don't have to be in house. They can be virtual and you know literally contracted in you know like on demand. Yeah, it makes sense. So really, you're saying, I guess, as early as possible. And I have to say, looking back, I wish I'd started outsourcing stuff earlier. It's funny you should mention outsourcing cleaning because I've had somebody in to do just like the washing up, really, which is not a big deal. But it takes me about half an hour a day because we eat a lot of food and drink a lot of coffee in this house somehow. And um, yeah, it, it just keeps striking. Every so often I have the discipline to hire somebody in. And then magically, I'll get another podcast out the door, which brings, you know, um, revenue and, and brand awareness and stuff, which no amount of washing up is ever going to do. So you're right, yeah. it's not necessarily just business. It's just winning back time, right? That's, um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's there's services for everything. There's, um, you know, I use Zipjet, which is um, London-based. So it's like laundry. They do, they pick up and deliver your laundry each week. There's, um, you know, uh, TaskRabbit, which is, you can get anything done. You know, you want a flat pack furniture built, you can just hire somebody for like, you know, £10 an hour or something. Amazing. And uh, that's where I get my cleaners from. And yeah, everything in between. You know, you've got everything is at your reach nowadays in terms of hiring out people per, per minute, per hour on anything you want. So really take advantage of that. Um, some places to check that out TaskRabbit, Zipjet, like I mentioned. There is uh, Get Magic. Which oh, is that. Get Magic's an, an awesome company. It's based over in uh, San Francisco. Um, they have um, per minute VAs. You can have a business account or you can have a personal account. You can hire, you can offload things to them, um, you know, super cheap and, you know, get, get things delivered to you, anything. They could set reminders on your phone. They can text you if, to pick up your children, anything you want. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So just so you, because yeah. you obviously don't want to forget that. 
<laughs> no, that would be bad. Um, I've actually used Airtasker as well, which is, I think, an Australian-based company, but that's where I found a cleaner from because TaskRabbit, somebody had mentioned to me and I found Airtasker was good. But anyway, I mean, you know, there's lots of services. Um, yeah, I guess absolutely. We'll just Google it. I mean, we, we're going to have a bunch of um, links to put in the show notes already. But so coming back to Amazon, I mean, but I like the idea that it's not just about business. It's not just about all or nothing. It's like you can mm -hmm. start immediately and you can outsource on mundane um, daily tasks. And I'm really like that. I really like the fact that I was sitting here doing a podcast one day when somebody's next door taking care of the washing up it's a great feeling if you haven't done it personally I love it I know some people are paranoid letting people in the house and whatever I'm like I just loved it but there you go um so the next question then coming back to the Amazon space what do we outsource and then what do we outsource first and so let's deal with the what things could we outsource let's, mm -hmm. let's deal with that question first no it's a great question so we as leaders as business owners we have a ton of things on our plate and there's a lot of stress frankly and press pressure if you're taking a step out there you're running a business you're taking care of everything um providing with your family so you're gonna this is not just like a one-off thing you need to constantly become addicted to removing things removing things off your plate um and you know one of the things we always have our clients do and i think we talked about it maybe a year ago on the podcast is always you know tracking your time regularly um it doesn't sound sexy, but what it does, it, it completely, you know, changed the game for you in terms of how productive you are, uh, where, you know, the amount of um, value that you can bring to the business because it creates awareness of where you're actually spending your time. So that will, that will reveal all to you um, if you have a clear way to track your, your time on a daily basis. So a tactical way to do that is just um, have a spreadsheet open and every time you switch task, uh, every time you... Um, change to do anything, whether it's look at your phone, whether it's um, do the washing up, whether it's uh, you know respond to a customer email on Amazon, or whether it's contacting a supplier over in China. Every time you switch task, you know uh, track it in terms of the time and how long it took you. And you know at the end of you know ten days, two weeks, you're going to have an absolute, you know, absolute clarity of you know what do I want to get rid of off this list because without that. You're gonna, you know, you're not gonna be 100 percent clear. The data speaks for itself. It's absolutely kicked my backside. Uh, it does every time. The first time I've done it, it was like, um, you know, I thought I was really productive, and it, it was quite humbling actually to <laughs> to do it because it was, uh, uh, you know, very far from the truth. So um, that's what I would highly, highly recommend you do that to get going, and then you you build it in as a as a system into your business, so you do it periodically through the year. So um, you're constantly have to evaluate where you're working and identifying on that list what is not bringing value to the business what could you outsource what part of that could you hand to somebody else um, and eventually you know you you'll move from contractors to to having a part-time person whether that's in you know local to you um, or overseas and then you know eventually go to full-time but that's what you know first and foremost to gain that clarity you need to you need to have a clear way to track and measure where you're spending your time makes a lot of sense so it really does and the thing is that the, the acts of measuring us um peter drucker the management consultant who i think was just one of the the most um really useful management consultants a lot of people write very fancy books that then turn out not to be very useful the next decade but he said what gets measured gets done right and if you don't measure time like you don't measure money famously businesses go broke um you know if you're not measuring your money uh, we'll come to the bookkeeping question in a second but i mean yeah if you don't measure time you don't know how you're spending it and you're right i use a, a system called toggle t-o-g-g-l i don't mm -hmm. know if you've used that but i'm mean, I, I yeah, just great I try and be rigorous now i try to be really anal about tracking my time so I can really look at the statistics at the end of a week and go, yeah, I didn't feel that project moved forward very much this month. And I feel frustrated about it. And like, no wonder, because I spent three hours on it this month when I mentally spent 20 hours worrying about it. But it's, it's very, very easy for a solopreneur, mm -hmm. particularly. I, I just find you, you think about something a lot, but you don't actually sit down and, you know, whatever it is, map out the processes, send the emails, um, you know, place actual physical orders, whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think a, a reality check in terms of at least a week of being really, really ridiculously over measuring, I think is really incredibly powerful. So having done it, I agree with you. I mean, I'm not a naturally very structured person. So I think for me, it's particularly important. I mean, well, it's, you know, you, it's not just you, Michael. If you think about most business owners, they're visionaries, they're leaders, they're, they just want to make stuff happen. Mm. You know, most, for the most part, the details and things like that scare a lot of entrepreneurs because they're like, they've got this crazy big vision that they want to go make happen. And that's, and that's completely um, normal. But 
what what this will do, you know, and for your team members, you know, if you have team members that are you know high level, um, tracking their time will be able to enable them to remove things from their plate, so they can work on higher value um, areas. So, you know, this is absolutely you know critical and foundational, and that that doesn't ever stop. That's you know ongoing. You know, whether you do it every you know couple of months, every six months, um, it's it's up to you, but. The reality is the more you're clear on where you're spending your time because things evolve so quickly and things change rapidly, um, you know, you're going to have absolute clarity on, okay, well, what part of this two weeks that I've just spent time on is really not moving us forward? You know, yeah. so uh, if you're working on just react, reactive things, fighting fires, and you're not, you know, you're answering customer service emails, you're tracking down shipments, you are doing things like, you know, talking and, and trying to reconcile your books, things like that, um, which are typically, you know, T. Harvey has said that, you know, um, what usually happens is business owners, they spend 80% of their time in operations instead of 80% of their time on sales and marketing and strategy, which is uh, what we need to flip around. And uh, the faster you can do that and the more proactive you can be in that, you'll, you'll see your business absolutely explode because you'll be focusing on opening up new marketplaces, launching new products, um, building, uh, you know, systems around your, you know, the things that ultimately grow your business and, uh, you know, put you on the, uh, the path that you're looking for. Because I think a lot of the time we get stuck at, you know, uh, a glass ceiling of growth um, because it's 80% operations managing and, and, you know, checking tasks and, and pushing them through. Um, and a lot of people wonder how they can continue to grow without having more hours in the day. And the, you know, the simple answer is uh, having a team in place, uh, you know, and a structure and, and systems around the things which uh, you can kind of offload. Okay, so you just mentioned a few specific examples. So can you, can you say from experience what, um, what kind of tasks you find um, Amazon business owners should be? outsourcing and also just more specifically what things should you outsource first because we mentioned a few things uh, you've also mentioned the thing of you don't have to go from nothing to outsourcing everything um, yes you should measure your time so that's a critical reality check but in general because you've seen the patterns yourself now would you say if you had to generalize mm -hmm. what's the one or two sort of areas that you should hire that first five or ten hours a week of, of somebody's time for yeah absolutely so um, I'm going to be honest it's going to be I like to have somebody who can handle all of the customer service, all of the day-to-day the -day that comes in, but also is capable to help me out in my kind of personal life as well. So hiring somebody um, like a, you know, like a, a PA, you know, a virtual uh, PA is fine just to help out with any life admin that you have. Cause frankly, there's a lot of that stuff that comes in and, you know, also somebody can, you know, also help you with all of the, um, customer service based um, activities, whether that's answering to answering customer service emails within Amazon, you know, checking and responding to reviews, processing refunds, uh, for, for fulfillment orders, um, responding to your Facebook page uh, messages, um, anything regarding forward facing, uh, low value tasks like that, which you can easily, you know, put into a process and hand over to somebody else. So, we can talk a little bit how, about how to do that tactically today. I'm, you know, definitely more than happy to do that. But usually, it's somebody to to lower the stress on you personally, but also to lower um, the incoming, you know, customer service based inquiries. And you know, you can start there, uh, and then ramp up their responsibility over time. So they can start um, with the basics: answering customer service emails, responding to reviews, seller feedback, um, and then you can. Um, offload more of the high responsibility things onto their plate, like dealing with Amazon cases, um, you know, having processes in place for uh, removing hijackers, things like that, which are, um, you know, can they can work into that. Okay, Does that, that make sense? sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And actually, I like the fact that, again, you, this is not an all or nothing proposition. You, you make it very, very clear that you can start off with. Um, something anything that you can put in place as a simple process is the place to start and then over time you can ramp up the responsibility but you don't have to hand your business over in one go and i think that the two resistances to outsourcing that i sense in myself and certainly in, in clients that i've worked with and they're mostly mastermind members now um 
is uh, yet yeah, number one, the money. And you've got to think about the greater value of your time and have a longer vision than just purely the profit this month. And, and the second thing is that, that trust. And um, so we'll talk about that in a second. So who you hire and how you hire is obviously critical, but mm -hmm. starting off with something that isn't mission critical is probably also good as well. And, uh, and then ramping up to more complex things like how do you handle hijackers? Um, yeah, I mean, just on that note, yes. just, a, just a little example is, let's say you are spending 10 hours a week on custom service um, and you're doing, that's 40 hours a month on customer service. Um, but you know, if you remove that from your plate, you would have 40 hours to work on creating and launching a new product. Um, and let's just assume that, you know, one product can bring you in um, 5,000 pound or $5,000 a month in, in gross revenue. Let's say two grand of that is, um, just, just to keep it simple, two grand of that is net profit. So if you were to work on launching uh, one or two new products with that new 40 hours in, in that month, then that's a clear way on how you, know, you will bring in per product, if it's 5K uh, revenue, then that's, you know, that is over 50K um, in, yeah, 60K in revenue for the, for the year. And that is just with one product. So removing that 40 hours from your plate allows you to focus on creating um, a product which is literally going to generate 50k per time you do it. Yeah, absolutely. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And the thing is that people who are nervous about that should think about the business modeling because big, really we are arbitraging the difference between um, being able to buy goods in bulk because nobody probably normally needs a thousand iPhone cases, but but a business will buy that any day mm -hmm. of the week and also the arbitrage between um, Chinese um, factory costs and what retail, what um, consumers in the West will buy, mm -hmm. wherever you're selling it, actually doesn't matter where it is, but it's, it's arbitrage between those two. So if we're not willing to arbitrage the difference between the value of our time and the value of a VA's time, that shows you have no faith in, in the fundamental act we're involved in, which is to say that you're going to have to buy things in at a certain value. And that mm -hmm. business model only works if you then do something at the other end that has got more value. So it just struck me that it's really kind of a similar thing. You buy a VA's time at uh, $5 an hour and you mm -hmm. do something that will generate enough revenue to be worth about $40 an hour of your time, right? So in other words, you're, you've are you got to have some faith in the value you bring to your business in the first place. And then you well, yeah, I mean, if, if, you do it. <laughs> if it takes, if it's like, if you spend 40, 40 hours um, on a task which can make you in, in, a, in a month that can bring you in uh, it's 60 grand for the year, then you know, that's the hourly rate on that is way higher than focusing on uh, customer service or, Absolutely. Yeah. or ref processing refunds or I'm just trying to doing your out. cleaning uh, or. Yeah, 60,000 divided by 500. The hell is that? Uh, it's some, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's like $120 an hour or something. It's actually really very high. When you think about that, the, um, the return on investment of actually a successful product. And even if you're cynical and you've been around the block and say, oh yeah, that works in theory, but not every product is a win. Okay. So look, maybe one product in three and then it's $40 an hour as opposed to $5, which is customer service, right? You, you can't get around the maths of the thing that we have yeah, to so focus on the higher value tasks. If you spend 40 hours working on a product, which generates you, uh, you know, 50 grand in the year, then that's. Twelve hundred and fifty pounds dollars per hour that works out, and again, it's never obviously perfect. But the the, the point here, what we what we what we're saying is, when you consistently remove these things from your plate, you don't that doesn't even have to come into your um you know your mind space. Then all you're focusing on is how you can improve your product launch system, how you can get better at launching products. So it's 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 a compounding um, return of investment. Um, as you you know, if you're removing customer service, bookkeeping. Uh, inventory management, daily admin off your plate, then the things which are really important to grow the business, product creation, launch systems, growing your audience, uh, going, you know, going away from Amazon, building assets, you become better at them over time, which then you can use to make more money on and off of Amazon. I agree. So, yeah. I, I think it's one of those things, sorry to interrupt, but I just think it's so worth ramming the point home with people who are actually pretty good sellers and, and pretty in some ways very sophisticated business people is that they get way too wrapped up in, in I mean, cash flow is critical and, and profit and losses as well, but they get wrapped up in um, doing 
being part of the machine that generates the cash and that's addictive but yeah what you're getting better at if you do a lot of customer service is customer service whereas if you do a lot of product development you get better at product development and it's just a higher paid skill right i guess to summarize Absolutely. what you're saying the, the the time tracker will tell you everything you know if you're spending if you if if you track just say you tracked your time for the whole year every single day and um you had in one in one quarter you had you know massive growth uh, you can bet your money or you you know that if you look on the activities where that growth came from you know it will be around profit generating activities so there's a direct correlation of course on the you know, way you're spending your time in your business you know the value that that actually brings and the results that bring to your business but because we are so in the forest you can't you know we can't see the the forest so to speak you know we're so close to the trees yeah you can't see the wood for the trees now that's that's totally an issue for all small business people i think and it's that's one of the reasons why I run masterminds and why it's so valuable. I mean, these guys, you know, it's Q4. Like I had a meeting on Wednesday with people like one of the guys doing 7 million euros a year. And, and you know, um, he's flown over from Europe to, to come to this mastermind. But he's out of the office. That's actually a good thing because he's thinking bigger term, longer term, bigger picture. And that should be his job. So actually, yeah, there's a great value in stepping away from these things. So let's talk about then so that the value of the outsourcing versus the cost so the cost is one barrier the other one's the trust thing and with with reason because you don't always get great people right and if you hand over something to somebody and uh, they don't do well that tends to be in some cases that's the the nail in the coffin for people who are oh, tried outsourcing once it didn't work so obviously this is a primitive approach but i'm just reflecting you know some of the reality that people seem to bring up so the critical question next then is how do you find good people yeah so i think it's um it's a common challenge across, you know, so many you know online businesses. They've had or they've heard nightmare stories around outsourcing. It's just um, an area which just seems like a huge elephant that they don't know, you know, how to start uh, taking chunks out of it. So, I think it's uh, crucial to get started with first and foremost identifying, you know, where you need help. So. Again, I'm going to keep going back to it, but understanding where you're spending your time on the time tracker is going to give you that information, which basically writes the you know the the job posting or the the thing you need to hire for. That's a simple way to look at it. And um, I feel that if you do have a a company which has a clear um, mission of where you're going and what's important in terms of um, you know company priorities for the year ahead, the quarter, and you know, st strategic planning in place, you can be clear that when somebody comes steps into your, your company, they're going to be absolutely clear on what the company is about, what it stands for, um, what's expect, you know, what role they're going to be filling and what the outcomes they're responsible for. Um, it, it starts, you know, that kind of far back. If, if you're bringing somebody, you know, in house, you know, or full time, then, you know, that's what you're going to need to set you up to have that, um, that hire be most productive and, and come on into your business uh, with the, the, meet, the, the most amount of success. If you're just hiring out a process or a part of that, then, you know, granted, you won't have to, you know, have that strong of a foundation in place in terms of um, your, your strategic planning, you know, where you're going for the year, quarters, month, and, and so forth. But that does really, really help. It starts off with having clarity around that um, having clarity around the role that you're you're hiring for, and um, having a clear structured hiring process in place to filter out um, the people that, frankly, are good talkers but are not good, you know, doers. So um, interesting. So I guess my question implied what's the hiring process, and your answer implied why you call your business systems and culture uh, impact as opposed to just systems com or whatever you might call it because uh, I think what you've just said is really critical like you've got to have a clear mission you've got to have a strategic plan what's your company stand for what's the role about what outcomes they want and actually um, this is to flip it on its head I would say my experience of outsourcing as somebody that uh, is not naturally very structured but appreciates structure it's funny because my background is a classical musician and I was a conductor so um, mm -hmm. you know and pianist so they're, they're famous they're quite anal and structured about things and yet kind of in the end of the day were action oriented not than, than process oriented well i am and but the act of having to outsource to somebody means you have to articulate this stuff and i think sometimes the act of articulating it 
is actually the true value. You might hire somebody who turns out to be a disaster, but going through the process of having to articulate what are we actually trying to achieve when I'm thrashing around on the computer on a spreadsheet for 10 hours a week, why the hell am I doing that? Actually, you might discover it's like the Tim Ferriss thing, eliminate before you delegate. You might discover that what you're doing is pretty valueless and you shouldn't be doing it at all. That's, that's <laughs> which so is true. really valuable, right, to discover that. I think that's yeah. like, but also what you just pointed out, and that's more mundane. Most people don't do it, but at least in theory, we get that. But what you just pointed out is more critical Critical. Like if you don't know what you stand for, if you don't know what a role is about, why do customer service, what outcome do you want, then there's no way anyone's going to do it well. And that includes yourself, right? And it, when you hire somebody, it becomes more obvious. But that's been a problem all along. And, and I would say it's, it shines a spotlight on, on what the hell you're doing all day anyway. So yeah. I, I really like the fact you brought that up. It's really critical. Absolutely. So, you know, in terms of tactics of hiring, um, First and foremost, it starts with having clarity on what role you need to fill. You know, where do you need help? And the fastest way to do that is to be able to track your time. You know, if you if you do a download of all the things you've done over the last two weeks and look at your to-do list, that's going to give you a great clarity of, oh my God, I'm doing all this stuff and it's just driving me mad. Uh, it's keeping me away from X, Y, and Z, you know, growing my business, launching new products. And that's where it starts. That helps build your, you know, if it's your first hire, then that helps build the the outcomes that that new hire is going to be responsible for. So we've always used scorecards, which is outcome based, um, kind of like um, for it's from a book which is called Top Grading. It's a great book. It's um, it's been used uh, across m like huge organisations on how to effectively hire A players, and we took the scorecard concept from that which is basically just talking about the specific outcomes this person is going to be responsible for um you know what are the kind of requirements that they need as a you know uh to fulfill the role and um you know what what is their role gonna kind of entail so we use that in terms of our the beginning part of our hiring process we obviously have a a job posting um which is raising people's interest in the role um you know, which is people, frankly, you know, they want to know what's in it for them, right? So what will they get is, um, you know, you need to appeal to that um, with people in a job posting. Um, when they apply, takes them to a scorecard, takes them um, through a, a bunch of questions. We usually have them do kind of a, a one and done task, which is a great way to filter. Um, if I If I talk about this in filtering through um, all the applications you get um, on different levels, you're going to end up with a few candidates which are um, really, um, really aligned with the outcomes that you're looking to achieve and also alignment of your culture or company culture. So um, that's going to be the, the context there. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And just to reflect back, because I think this is critical stuff that people need to hear. I and mean, by the way, if you want show notes for this, then um, we'll we'll figure out how to um, to put them up. But just uh, for the moment, go to amazingfpa.com um, forward slash Aaron, A-A-R-O-N. If I've got that right, it's Aaron with an O, isn't it? Not an A. That's correct, yeah. Um, so, um, and obviously, we'll be getting a new blog up for the, for the new podcast as well. We're in sort of transition stage. But you sort of think it can be useful to see written down. But just to, to reflect back for those who are listening in the car and uh, need to, to get this stuff. You've got to clarify the role. Um, and the best way to do that is look at your time tracking for the last two weeks and look at your to-do list. And if there's a gap, I guess, between your, I want to do this, but I'm doing this, that's, that's obviously a big hint, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then have clear outcomes. And I like the scorecards from the top grading book. Sounds very interesting. Um, get very specific outcomes, requirements for the role and define the role. And then the job posting needs to raise interest and what's in it for me, ask that question. When you apply, you have quite a few questions, I guess, normal enough. Um, so I wanted to ask about the what questions to ask. Um, but before I do that, what's this one and done task? How does that work? Yeah, so great question. So what I will say is if anyone who wants to see an actual job posting that we have uh, yeah. on our website, you can go to our website and find that. Um, it's under join our team. You can just see our process in there of what that looks like. So I think that would be super helpful for the guys uh, and girls listening in yeah. terms of um, you know how we how we have a job posting and we we use a type form we've we've automated our uh, process with that so we have a job posting then type form and within that type form we 
uh, type form, we uh, extract all the questions and get all the information we need around the um, the application. And in that has the um, the scorecard embedded and all the referrals we need. And it also has a one and done task. So let me talk on that for a, sh a short second. So in terms of our one and done task, it's a, um, a task which they can complete um, pretty quickly, which is going to give you um, a lot of, you know, a lot of info around the type of person that has responded. So an example that we had, um, we had a, for the customer service, it was actually for a customer love manager, somebody who's going to be able to manage a lot of customer service agents. So the question we had in that case was, uh, I'm staying at this hotel in London, I think it was the Shangri-La in London, and um, I need a thousand letters, uh, I need to deliver a thousand letters to go out international. Um, can you find the, the nearest post office uh, to my hotel and give me directions? Something of that nature. So it tells, and this is what I'm talking about, you know, quick ways to filter through all of the applications. And that's what top grading does well. Um, you know, the concept of hiring from, from top grading. Uh, and this is one of the first filters. Um, the application basically is set up. So if we don't have people fill it out or if people don't um, provide referrals or if, or if people don't give us, a, you know, anywhere near a good enough, good enough answer for the one and done task, they don't, you know, get through to the, the next stage of the hiring process. So um, some people would just answer, um, sure, sir, I'll get back to you. And that was it. Some people would go through um, the um, the effort of creating step-by-step -step instructions to them exactly where I'm walking, give me screenshots from Google Maps of where to find that post office and was just delivered in a really high, um, high level way in terms of, you know, customer service because it was a customer service based role. Yeah. So immediately when I, you know, I was scanning for all these applications in type form. Um, when once they've been, we had like 60 or 70, um, I was scanning for all of these. And then the ones that were, um, that was kind of the first thing I'd look at is how they filled in the form and how they answered the question. If they didn't answer it well, then I'd just, you know, in our automation, I'll just move over to unsuccessful and then they'd get, uh, an email sent out which says uh, we're we're sorry didn't make it through to the next round. Thank you so much for applying. Um, if they made it through, they'd be moved over um, in our project management software to uh, the next stage, and they would have a skills and aptitude test sent to them automatically. Um, does okay. that make sense? Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to overcomplicate this too much because I know it's kind no, of no, but it sounds pretty. I mean, to me, it sounds fairly straightforward. But I mean, if you, the the trick is. Uh, as I was saying, I was saying the 10K Collective Mastermind the other day, look, I mean, um, it's like in the music profession. We audition, we don't interview. So, I mean, like, if you want to go for a job as a pianist somewhere, or I used to be a French horn player professionally in orchestras, as you do, unusual background from an Amazon seller, but um, we all come from all different walks of life. And, you know, you don't go in there and have a chat for half an hour about how you would play this phrase. You go in there and say, hi, how are you? Yeah, good to see you. It's like 10-second conversation. Mm -hmm. And then here's the music, go. And then if they're crap, you can tell instantly. If they're good, you put them into the orchestra for a trial, which is something else I want to talk about and you you might be on trial for a job in orchestra for a year um, and there'd be two or three other people up for the same job and then they pick one or if they didn't think anyone was good enough they pick nobody but it's all about how do you deliver in an individual situation like this like on a task and then how do you deliver in the team and then it comes down to you know uh, can you deliver or not it, it, the conversations uh, are pretty irrelevant because you're not being asked to talk to people anyway so Absolutely. in a lot of ways I, I think it's very familiar territory to me and, and it's a very tried and tested thing um so i really like the fact that it's based around that um totally. talking of that we can talk about the skills and aptitude test in a second but i mean tell me a little bit more about what i've just talked about i mean for me the, the idea that you have two or three people trialing for a job and then you pick one is standard for the music industry specifically the classical music industry it's a funny little mm -hmm. world that happens mm -hmm. to be familiar to me. Is that something you do? Do you think that's too brutal? Do you think that's too confusing? What What's your view on that? Oh, what? So when you no, know, it should be a tough decision. You know, if, when you if you've done this correctly and you've got um, the applications come in, there's going to be a small percentage of the the people that are going to be fitting your you know fitting your culture. You know, you need to hire for culture first. As you know, that's kind of become cliche, but it's so true. Hire for you know, the, the attitude that the person has, and obviously they need to be competent in the role and they need to be, um, you know, capable for sure. So in terms of 
the question you asked, it should be tough to make a decision on who you're going to bring onto your company for sure. And if it's not, you know, if, if you don't have two or three people to compare and, you know, it, you know, I think you need to revisit the, the, the process, the steps beforehand. So it should be difficult because what people tend to do is just hire somebody. They don't run through, a, you know, a filtering process. Um, I just want to give you the context again in terms of the, the, the stages of the hiring. So it's, it's clear, which is what we've used. And there's a number of ways to do it. So um, what we do is we create, um, we post the job posting, uh, which is, has the scorecard it involved and um, basically retrieve all the information from their previous employers there. It's kind of like they post their work history. Um, they post references and they give us, one and done task. That's the, the first stage. So if we have 60 applicants in that, I can quickly scan through each one and say, well, this person, I, I don't even have to read through half of them because, um, you know, if they did a terrible job in filling out the form, then I just know that it's not going to work. Um, so that's the first stage. The second stage is, you know, having them go through a personality test, a skills and aptitude test, um, which is really um, a great way to find out um, you know, what, what they're competent in. So if it's a customer service based role, you can quickly find uh, free tests, um, like 16 personalities to tell you um, what kind of person they are. Um, there's a great one called Criteria Corp, which is what we use, which is more higher level. Um, but it is, there's, it's a, it's a, it's a yearly uh, thing that you pay for, but it's incredible. It's created by guys in Harvard. And it's like, it tells you, you can have a customer manager customer service based skills and aptitude test um, we get the results back from that and that is very telling and then the people that have made it through that then we say okay the next is a 15 minute interview if they pass that then it's a an hour tandem interview with um, you know me a business partner or and another team member and or another team member and then you know at that point you should have two or three people that you're you know trying to make a decision on does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So just to just to clarify then the overall process, this is great stuff, by the way. I really like this. Um, very structured. It's always good. Uh, stage one is they basically fill in the type form. So it's the, the scorecard, referrals, job history, and the one and done task, which you've explained really nicely. Second stage is for those who make it through the aptitude and skills test. Stage three, 15-minute interview. Stage four, tandem interview. I like that. I've never heard of that. Uh, bicycle made for two and uh, interview made for two. I guess <laughs> I like it. And then, yeah, you've got... So so you, and at the end of that, you have you, you have um, what two or three really qualified um, candidates. What, what do you do then about this? Um, to come back to this idea that I had, um, because it's not just me that does this. That somebody else was saying in the group, uh, you know, hire four, fire three, keep one. I mean, it's a bit brutal to go in knowing that that might happen. But do you um, advocate or use the the thing of giving people trial periods, and do you trial more than one person for the same kind of job? Sure. So I think it's you know the way you should kind of always hire, if you're bringing somebody into your business, um, you've gone, you've put them through this, this, you know, rigorous hiring process, um, which we just talked about, uh, you know, job posting, scorecards, uh, skills and aptitude test, 15 minutes interview, one hour tandem interview, you know, with another, you know, two or three team members. And that should get you somewhere, you know, near. And if you've got, um, somebody come into the team, you're going to want to know how they perform within the team and how everybody else feels about them as well. So um, I would recommend having, you know, a two, either a two week to get, to get you going to say, we're going to try it for two weeks. And if things are good, then we're going to then extend that to a three month um, probation kind of period where we're, we're seeing how we work together and then we just roll in after that. So it's important that you clarify that up front to them, you know, and give that visibility ahead of time for sure. But, Usually, if you if you've done this right, and if you've gone through that process, which I've just explained, then you're going to be you know somewhere very near. Yeah, Does that, that makes make a sense? lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why I suppose people have to be sort of brutal in in I would not have to be choose to be rather sort of crude and, and hire. I mean, I have just literally hired three people for the same kind of role is too grand a word, but the same kind of tasks, I guess, processes. Mm -hmm. Um, before just just as a tryout but I guess it's a version of your one and done thing but yeah if you have to hire a lot of people and then fire a lot of people it probably does mean you're not filtering people out that effectively uh, it's sort of filtering at the end rather than early and your process sounds like it's pretty thorough so you're trying to filter out people early on 
Uh, and also if you're very clear about your own culture and the role and what you need as outcomes, and then you communicate that clearly, which is two different forms of, of art to get good at, I guess then that also helps, right? If you're clear in your own mind, if you're clear to other people, you then have a structured process to get to the people who are doing that. I guess by the time you've done all that, you shouldn't need to, you know, be, be firing people left, right and center all the time anyway. And, and as you said, if you've got a two week tryout and then a three month tryout, it's sort of gradually committing over time rather than, yeah. right, we've done this, now we're in. And I think uh, my experience with uh, people to get very insulted in it and exasperated about VAs and stuff is that they are unclear and they're, I mean, I've done, I've been this person, right? you know, I probably still am in something. We all have. Yeah, I mean, um, examples of where I outsource that has worked well, my podcast editor, for example, uh, examples of where it's not worked so well, I've got a bookkeeper who's who's really intelligent guy, probably too intelligent, Indian guy who tend to be mm -hmm. quite precise and that's another cultural differences thing to negotiate, right? The, the podcast is American, so he's used to me kind of throwing stuff at him and he just kind of makes it work and, and doesn't doesn't get upset about being imperfect whereas the filipinos famously are perfectionist and it's is all that stuff but i mean i would say in most cases where it hasn't worked i've just threw a load of bookkeeping at him and said do my bookkeeping as opposed to thinking through for myself in articulating what do i really need for this process and then above all um, not articulating to him, I don't need the most complete tax accounts in the world. It's not going to be examined by Deloitte or, or somebody next week. What yeah. I need is management accounting that will give me profitability by product line. And it wouldn't have taken me long to articulate that to him. And I didn't. I just said, do it. And of course, he's now spent hours on my books. Yeah. And I'm thinking, do I need to fire this guy? I'm not yeah. getting the result I want. And of course, I didn't explain the result up, yeah. up front. So that's a well, classic that's example of how not to do it from my yeah, so experience. On that, I think you made a great point, Michael. So when, what usually happens when we hire people is we we are, you know, the micromanager. We are giving them a task, we're, you know, and then they're coming back to us. We're spoon feeding them tasks, and uh, which, you know, we're, once they've done that, then we give them another task. You know, that's gonna be the most, that's why people really struggle with hiring people and team is because of that reason. So what's gonna be, absolutely critical if you give them absolutely clear outcomes specific results that you want and you know let them figure it you know figure some of it out themselves you know so it depends on the role that you hire for of course but you know let's say that you are um, you know instead of giving them everything and you know if you think about the amount of work they're supposed to be taken off your plate not adding more to your plate so the the, the whole point of hiring a team is so they can remove um, you know stress and and, and task and areas of the business from your plate and own them and be responsible for them and giving them clear outcomes of what is, what you're looking for and then kind of coaching them, you know, on what they've done. And that is how you basically scale a team. If you're looking, if you're going to be doing that spoon feeding task forever, then no wonder people, you know, this is what I see a lot. No wonder people don't want to hire because it's, like, Oh, I've got, you know, um, Another task to do is tell them what to do now and they keep coming to me instead of giving them clear results that they're going to be responsible for and then just, you know, coaching them and mentoring them along the way um, is, you know, one of the biggest things which is it changes the game for people. And, um, you know, that comes from like uh, Vern Harnish's book, Scaling Up, you know, coaching and mentoring any of your team members on the outcomes that you're looking for is going to be the most powerful things for them because they feel cared for, they feel respected, they feel uh, important, which they are. And you're also showing them how to grow as a person as well. You're not just spoon feeding tasks. You, you know, I don't know about you, but I would hate to be told every task what to do, how to do it. And, you know, I want to be able to be responsible for some part, which is moving the, the company forward uh, towards a, the predefined goals that you, you set for the year, for the quarter, for the month. And as a team member that has having a part in helping your team achieve these goals and outcomes, there's nothing more exciting. And, you know, you, you really become a team then. If you yeah. are just micromanaging them and yeah. giving them tasks without clear outcomes, then they're going to become annoyed and it's going to be exhausting for you. Absolutely. So, uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, um, because I've experienced both again. I mean, like with the, the, oh, the, Don't the, worry. the, the, the bookkeeping guy, for example, um, Mudit, he has a name and, and a good guy. I mean, he's got a background. He worked for Deloitte in, in India. So I'm mean, obviously quite a high power guy. And I think he'd way probably too high power for me. So I probably should have said, look, this is going to be shockingly primitive. It's a culture thing, I guess, like Indian, very precise. Somehow, I don't know why they're very seem mathematically oriented. And, and that's yeah. make good programmers and good accountants, I guess. I don't traditionally seem to be good at those skills. I'm not saying that's all they do. We're talking about 1.1 billion people. But, you know, <laughs> traditionally, they're very good at those skill sets, particularly. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I can see why. But again, that's almost like a culture clash between that Indian thing, the, the kind of Western entrepreneur, the online entrepreneur versus the corporate culture. There's a few cultural differences I can see there. And I, I can see now in retrospect, I should have sat down and said, look, it's a small business. The sort of thing that you would find shockingly, ridiculously amateurish is probably exactly what I want. The sort of thing you would think of as professional is what I would think is ridiculously over the top and not necessary. So let's mm -hmm. clarify that. And I should have said, um, the reverse engineering, I need to get hold of this guy and talk to him about and, and said, here is um, the outcomes that I want. And here's what doesn't interest me out of the traditional bookkeeping mm -hmm. things. And the yeah. thing is also, I can't just say, it's not like customer service that I've done to death. I can't just say, do this, then do this. I can't even micromanage him because I'm not competent enough in bookkeeping to do that. I mean, it's, it can get complex quickly. I, what I need to do is set clear outcomes and then ask him, okay, so from the bookkeeping specialist perspective, what do you think we need to do? Instead That's of which, it. He's been kind of micromanaging me because yeah. I gave him like such a generalized thing. He's been going, okay, I need this account and I need this. And by the way, I want your mortgage statement now. And I'm like, uh, why do you need this? So I don't understand why he wants stuff from me. He doesn't understand yeah. what I want from him. It's just, it's, it's not pretty. And I have to say in my defense that with the podcast, for example, we've got a little team chat and my podcast editor knows that he's part of something that is trying to achieve an outcome of, of launching a course and trying to reach a new audience. And, and uh, my webmaster is also part of that. So there is a, a team culture and funnily enough, it works much better. <laughs> so I can yeah. endorse what you're saying from more. Yes, yeah, it totally experience. does. And, on that point which you just made having it's it's having a you know a clear you know mission purpose around what you stand for you know is the basis of your company culture right <laughs> where you're going together that's strategic planning at its best what's the, you know the the BHAG where are we going you know what's our outcome who do we want to really help and serve and that's the the long time the long term then you've got the year ahead the quarter ahead the month ahead what do we do this week and you know that is you know missing from so you know the majority of of businesses um out there and the reason the biggest companies in the world are the biggest companies in the world because they have that process locked down in place you know yeah like there, there's it's, it's a clear correlation the only difference between a, a big company and a small company is process and systems that's literally you know, the difference that's that's what it is so wow. um that's quite a statement. The only that's a very tweetable. The only difference between a big company and a small company is that is the culture and the processes that have in place. I mean, I guess you could argue they have a lot more money and stuff, but then on the other hand, they got to that place because they had a vision. So they got to that place because they had a clear direction, you know, in terms of where they're going, you know, for the year ahead. Like Apple and these companies like uh, Microsoft, they plan like five years ahead, like four or five years ahead. You know, if we just plan a year ahead, we're going to be miles ahead of most people. But yeah. the, why it's relevant to this conversation is because when you're bringing on new team members, you know, you need to hire people that really believe in what you're doing and, and want to get behind that and be part of this team. Because if you hire somebody that's not really interested, is going to do a half assed job, then you're going to always have problems there. And yeah. they're not going to fit the culture. They're not going to understand it. They don't want to be there. And they're not, not going to deliver. Yeah. And um, they're not going to be able to build that team, which is going to really climb that mountain with you together, you know, and, and really have everybody's back. Because that's what, you know, I think it should be about. Yeah, and I remember going to some management uh, thing years ago. I mean, I was working for a local music service, which was pretty uninspiring, but they actually, they were inspiring enough uh, people. I, I mean, I, I found the job itself extremely boring and I left, but which is right, because I wasn't a fit for their culture. <laughs> no, but, okay. um, no, but uh, they brought some management consultants in, of all things, which is pretty unusual for a local music service, like teaching mm -hmm. beginner trumpet, whatever, which is what I was doing at the time. And actually, uh, they brought some people in and said, look, when you've got a team, you've got to think about each member of the team has their own personal goals you've got to appeal to, which is the what it's in it for me thing. But they also need to buy into the team goals. And then there was something else. I forget the third component, which may be critical. But the point is that it's no, it's whilst it's no good saying we are, you know, an amazing company and I'm obsessed with myself. And they go, yeah, well, why should I do this? You've got to answer that question. But I think that the next level of mistake is to not really do anything except say, yeah, I'm going to pay you lots of money and that should be enough. Is people want to be part of something bigger than themselves? And actually, it's so easy to overlook that to be cynical and go, these guys just want five dollars an hour. You know, it's they don't. I, my experience is you know recognition I, i'm personally in the same if, if i'm doing something for somebody a bit of recognition just really counts like if somebody's paying me you know hundreds of pounds to, to go to a mastermind with me or, or mentoring or something it still matters to me say like mike 
thanks that was a great day that really helped me it still feeds me because that's part of my mission that's part of why i do stuff it's never just about the money uh, whether Absolutely. it's tiny money or big money and and it's easy to forget that i think because we get so numerically driven as amazon sellers um because it's all online we forget that you've got to inspire people and well um, you're going to always have that challenge of you know if there's if there's no real buy-in from them you know to make money is not inspiring people they can do they can help a company make money anywhere in the world if they can be a part of something which is bigger than themselves giving them you know uh you know that um recognition and appreciation appreciation they deserve which are helping you move towards your predefined outcomes um and being part of that team is something i think everybody wants to be part of yeah well, look, I mean, we've got a million things we could ask uh, about this. I've just got a couple more questions, and I'd love to yeah, ask a bit more about what you um, do at Systems Culture Impact, because obviously, uh, unsurprisingly, you specialize in this stuff. You've obviously got really clear, insightful processes in place, very impressive. So um, one, one couple of quick questions then about the, the things that keep coming up. Um, again, with some quite serious people, this isn't just a newbie kind of question with outsourcing, um, or indeed the question of outsourcing versus in-house hiring. What are your thoughts on that conundrum? Right. So it depends on you know where you where you kind of base. I think a lot of the time, it, it, in your particular situation, we talked about it a bit before, um, um, a bit earlier on in the podcast. If you're getting started hire out a process contractors are fine you know they can be anywhere in the world um i think there is um it completely depends on your situation but start off with processes getting things you know particular areas of your, of the business and then bring somebody in part-time um whether that's local to you um it's up to you it depends on the, the 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 profit you have in your business that you can afford to pay somebody local if you're based in uk usa uh, and so forth then you need to look at that uh, in regards to, um, do I want to have somebody local to me that can work virtual? We can we can connect every week if we want to because it's just down the road, or um, have them completely virtual. So, I think it depends um, on where you are in the state in in your business. You can hire amazing people virtually. People are growing virtual teams, you know, everywhere and doing it really really well. Um, it depends on. So when you say in-house, I presume that you mean having an office and having go, people go there. Is that I what you mean? No, that wasn't, you know what, that, that, was, that was what I meant and I actually articulated it really poorly. I mean, I suppose what we're talking about is a personal, in-person uh, assistant versus a virtual assistant. So you've answered that question very well, actually. I mean, oh, it right. can work yeah. in both cases. But yeah, I, mean, I, I think um, one of the things that's always struck me, I and mean, Tim Ferriss said this and he famously talks about outsourcing a lot, um, wh whether he's personally that great at it or not, I mean, people obsess about him. I'm not, I don't care. I think the ideas were valid, whether or not he did them all. It doesn't really matter. It's an interesting debate that gets the answers, um, just to lance that boil. But yeah, he was talking about um, the whole thing of like people obsess about cost per hour, and he says the right metric is cost per completed task. And to give an example, coming back to bookkeeping, it might be that this Indian dude who's who's incredibly well qualified and clever, it seems to me, and is working me for, for between ten and sixteen dollars an hour, depending which skill set he's using, like the whole accounting versus bookkeeping, versus my um, British-based accountant who I've worked with for a while, who's ninety pounds an hour, so whatever that one hundred and ten dollars, whatever it is. It may be I'll end up going back to her because I can clarify stuff to her and I'll articulate to her. She understands me. She understands perhaps British entrepreneurial culture and how we work and all the compromises we're willing to have. Um, perhaps it, that might be the better spend of money and actually overall cheaper to end up with a set of accounts that are usable management accounts for me. So um, I always think that's a really important thing to bear in mind. If you've got any other thoughts on that as somebody who does deal with virtual teams. Right. So um, I think the question is working out whether you have somebody like a contractor, like in your case, a bookkeeper that you can go and visit and see and, and connect with, right? Yes. Versus, versus virtual. Uh, virtual, yeah. So in, in that situation, I think that can be completely uh, done virtual. But I think there needs to be, um, you know, for things like bookkeeping and accounts, having, um, you know, f for, for us at least, having that with a company that can scale with us is really, really important because we don't want to particularly have to grow, you know, a big accounting department in our company because right now you can get all that stuff taken care of, um, you know, off your plate and someone else manage it like overseas. If you're, if the guy's from India, you know, if he's working in a company, then usually that's, um, 
scalable view. So if you're if you're just working with one guy and your business trebled, he's going to really struggle to understand and keep up with that. If your business trebled, but you've got a team of accountants that are experienced in that and can do that overseas and deliver, all you need is delivery of these the specific reports you need to see and the numbers need to be accurate on time every month, right? It's right. a very straightforward kind of, you know, this black and white, right? Is is so, yeah. Is is not like there's no in between. It's like they, they need to be 100% right and they need to be on time every every time. So yeah. Um, with that, you know, with that in mind, if you're, if that's happening and you can connect with him on a call, but you know, on zoom once yeah. a month and yeah. that is all you need, you know, yeah. to go and sit down with him and go through stuff. I don't think it's necessary. The numbers speak everything. The, the outcome speaks everything and a call on zoom face to face is just as good as sat there with him. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, mean, I think the issue is not whether it's you put your finger on it. The, the question is not whether it's virtual or physically there. It's more a question of culture, isn't it? Because I'm, I'm, I've got a business coach who is um, in Seattle and Washington is eight hours, time, eight time zones away. I mean, it's, I've never flown there and it's way too far. That's not the problem because he's American internet marketer and I'm British internet marketer. There's enough cultural similarity that actually we speak kind of the same language, whereas my wife doesn't understand half the hell the things I say these days because you know we understand music kind to speak which is a speak in itself which has mm -hmm. no idea what i'm talking about i mean she's getting there she's bright lady and picked it up but my, my um mates in london if i ever mention like affiliate marketing or internet marketing or, or conversion rate they, they kind of look at me like i'm sorry i didn't quite get that so from that point of view maybe it comes down to a cultural match more than geography which i think you've just put your, your finger on something a very important distinction that i think people model together it doesn't really matter whether the person sitting next to you in a desk or not the, the fact is they need to understand you and you need to understand them and that, i guess i think it's just a broader cultural question i think it's just what is the specific outcome that yeah. i'm here to get yes culture or not if there's a specific clear outcome that you're looking for um like if they're from india or whatever this is a specific outcome that we want you know this is what we need to see each and every month and then we jump on a you know a monthly call to talk about you know anything that you know a strategic call for them uh giving you what they see in the numbers you know if they if you've got any questions for them then you can do that on that call but i just think having um a very clear outcome for, you know and having that um very very uh clearly explained and um kind of delivered to them so they understand exactly what you want and there's no in between then yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for my um, th th therapizing my relationship with my bookkeeper. I mean, it's funny because I, in theory, I know this because like, it's like a lot of things. I just the irony is and I'm, I fell right into I'm just relating this that the blood and guts and, and the kind of my mess up with this so that people can relate to it and get over their shame. Oh, totally. Because, uh, we all do it. You know, yeah, I mean, sure. totally. But the thing what I did is I'm like, I just impatience. Like I want this off my desk. I just want management consults. I just, you know, to the point where I was so impatient and quick. And this is such an entrepreneurial thing that you go just do it and the thing is do what you haven't clarified what it is you mm -hmm. haven't even clarified the scope of what it is you know and you haven't clarified the outcomes and you haven't clarified like you the bigger picture outcomes not just the deliverables but why in in the bigger context of the picture sorry big context of your business you want them at all okay i need management accounts not um, tax accounts i need to know profit loss by product why is this so that i can make decisions to develop products or kill them off and you know what I, yeah so i need to go and have that conversation so <laughs> thank you for your time on that last question then is really a really important one as well what do you do with the time you gain let's say that i, I stop spending hours banging my head against uh, spreadsheets for 10 hours a week trying to make sense of my numbers and mm -hmm. i gain 10 hours a week and maybe i spend an hour a week once things are set up managing this person so i've gained nine hours net if you like what is the most productive thing to do with that time you've already talked about product creation um, which is obviously critical for any um, um, e-commerce seller. Anything else that has come across your desk with your client base that they do that's different, that's productive for them? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for the most part, you know, people come to us, they're doing 10 to 30 hours, sometimes even more a week on operational tasks. So one of the challenges is, okay, well, once we take this off your plate, the customer service, bookkeeping, inventory management, what, what are you going to spend it on? You can't, you know, it's not going to work you know, I, I tell this to people, you know, we, we don't want to work with you if, if you're just going to go on holiday because you're not going to see the return. You know, you need to obviously allocate that time to, uh, to profit generation, um, whether that's creating new products and launching them, you know, not ha you're not having to do it all yourself, um, but the ideation of the, the products and, and uh, whether it's opening up new marketplaces, a lot of people um, are, are reaching to get to 
Europe or if they're in the USA or USA if they're in Europe because they know their opportunity is huge there, but they've already got the product lines. They've got everything in place. They just need to get it over there to capitalize on that. But, you know, that in some cases could be, you know, an extra you know, 50 grand a month for a lot of sellers. If they've got a successful established brand, the work, you know, is is minimal in, in getting over there compared to what you'd have to do if you, you know, started fresh, for instance. So they're two clear, um, very, you know, common ones, but um, more so is building your brand, building your audience, removing, you know, getting off of Amazon and not having all your eggs in that basket um, of being, just, you know, an Amazon seller where your focus is on, you know, capturing the low-hanging fruit on Amazon, for instance, building an asset like an email list, a database, um, you know, or messenger bot subscribers where you can basically make offers to uh, a group of people that love your products, love what you're doing and uh, can help you make more money on Amazon and help you make more money off of Amazon, sending them to your Shopify store or where, you know, whatever the store you have. Absolutely. I mean, th this absolutely makes uh, sense because you're basically, yeah, these, these are whole new chunks to your business or, or whole new expansion possibilities rather than just the, the day to day. And it just struck me while we were talking that, um, one of the reasons, I and mean, it's kind of obvious, but one of the reasons we don't expand into new things is we get into a comfort zone. We get good at what we're doing. And I guess the whole point of expanding a business and being an entrepreneur is if you're too good at what you're doing, it's probably because you've been doing the same thing for a while, which means you're not expanding your business, which means as an entrepreneur, as distinct from a businessman, you know, business person, if you're running a corporate entity and you're CEO, maybe your business is going really well doing the same damn thing for 10 years. But if you're an entrepreneur, you're not doing the job if you're not outside your comfort zone, I guess. So it just struck me. No wonder we keep doing the same damn things. It's a lot more comfortable than going, right, now I'm going to go to Germany and I don't speak the language and I don't know how it's done and I don't know how to deal with VAT. And, you know, that's probably a sign of growing pains, right? Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, if you're, if you're only selling on Amazon, there's like hundreds of thousands of sellers, millions of Amazon, I think millions of sellers, sorry, yeah. um, all competing for the low hanging fruit you know that's when you launch a product you know a good way to get going but you know as soon as possible you know in in most cases i would even if you're starting out now i would be more focused on how can i build an audience before i launch because it's a whole different game if you're trying to capture the low hanging fruit on amazon with tens of thousands of sellers everybody's sending the same product from the same supplier you know and following the same system you're going to get the same results so how can you um, figure out how to build an audience around uh, a brand, a product line that solves and makes a meaningful difference in people's lives that you can, you know, you can use that audience to then launch on Amazon, um, you know, launch your products to Shopify. And that is an asset which is going to be critical if you're looking to sell your business down the line. You know, it's going to be a huge factor in determining the multiple that you'll get. You know, which obviously creates a high risk for any investor if or buyer if they don't have, you know, if Amazon's the only source of you know revenue stream, then that's you know going to lower the the money that you you can receive from all that hard work you poured into it. So, having having the right uh, systems in place with instructions on how to do all the the, the tasks are going to re reduce risk for a buyer. Having uh, and as, you know, assets away from Amazon that you can use to drive uh, offers to that audience are going to also um, present lower risk for a buyer. Absolutely. Well. Yeah, and funnily enough, we, we had um, the guys from um, uh, Providium, which is a Wall Street-based firm who are bringing private equity uh, investors as buyers of Amazon businesses. So we talked extensively about that. And it's funny how um, at the higher level, it's about connecting up the dots, right? It's putting together the outsourcing piece with the um you know the, the customer service piece with the you know the outsourcing and the culture of outsourcing and having systems and processes it all gradually adds up together to um sort of two sides of the same coin really so yeah i think um preparing your business to sell is the ultimate in now i'm going to have to get everything else sorted but as we said preparing to outsource your business as as we've just been discussing or going through the process of outsourcing things forces you to do i think just as valuable work on company culture which i think mm -hmm. you've articulated beautifully so you, you know what's really nice aaron about what your your message and, and everything you about you and clearly it comes through so clearly in our conversation is that the culture thing and the big picture and then linking that to the individual people and individual tasks is is really critical and i love that because it's quite different from the 
you know, the, the, the traditional approach to outsourcing, which is very mechanical. And I think that may be why people are struggling. Um, so tell us a bit more about what you guys offer. Obviously, you, you're very, very experienced in a lot of this stuff. It shines through what you're saying. What do you guys offer for, for people at systemscultureimpact.com who want to not just do this stuff on their own? Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me on today. Really enjoyed it. And hopefully it's been helpful for some people. So what we do really for six high six and seven figure sellers is we just come into their business and methodically remove inventory management, customer service, bookkeeping uh, off their plates with our pre-trained you know, FBA trained team. Uh, we already, we already have all the systems and the processes um, like standard operating procedures, which are basically written documentation on how to do all of that stuff. We just hand them kind of a filing cabinet um, for them and personalize it to their business. So we would remove inventory management off their plate, personalize all of our SOPs for their business and run it for them for three months to 12 months, um, depending on the client and you know how we want to get started. But that's really what we do. We remove things from the plate, get them organized with all of our SOPs to help them remove that glass ceiling so they can keep scaling their business. It's kind of like plugging in an operations department to businesses. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I mean, and it sounds really good. And I guess that, yeah, plugging an operations department in so you can focus on growing the business sounds kind of pretentious or, or kind of silly. But, uh, you know, in the first instance, if you're used to doing the work and there's a certain mentality amongst entrepreneurs that can happen with solopreneurs that, you know, it's, it's a bit like the, sh the small shopkeeper mentality works 70 hour weeks and, and has profit. And it, that's great. It's working, but it's not sustainable and it's not expandable. And I guess we have to be courageous enough to go, now I need to get myself out of, of that and focus, as we said, on, you know, just a, a small bit of maths on the, the value of a new product line versus the value of bookkeeping or customer service. It just is extremely compelling. So, yeah, absolutely makes sense to plug you guys in and then move on to bigger picture things. Yeah, so, so what people find helpful just to make it more clear, what people find most helpful, for, for, helpful is they don't have to go and find the staff, train them, hire them, onboard them, create the SOPs in the hopes that they got it right, in the hopes that they found the right person. We just bring all that. We have backup VAs, um, you know, if it's not working out, um, you know, at, at all times. And uh, we basically just take care of that whole, that whole thing and solve all the issues around their system that they've got and their current specific situation so Great. um yeah that's that's pretty much it if that's out if that's res if that resonates at all if you want to you know have a chat all you need to do is uh reach out and you can go to uh, systemscultureimpact.com forward slash go um and there'll be a short survey and we'll jump on a quick call and see kind of where you're at where you need if we can't help then i'll be more than happy to point you in the right direction Excellent. And I believe um, they've also got some free training on how to create a, uh, a product launch machine, if I understand that's right. So you, it's a, um, we're going to do a, um, a forward from amazingfba.com forward slash blueprint. Um, so do, what's, what's included in that, just briefly, if anyone's interested in that? Yeah, so in light of our conversation today of you know, setting up systems, one of the, the biggest ones for um, you know, Amazon people, e-commerce sellers is they are not wanting to do um, all of the tasks involved with launching a new product. So we want to be able to set up a well-oiled product launch machine. So yes, we can focus on creating the products, but we have a team in place to help execute on that launch process. So you can come up with the ideas, you can approve and oversee and coach along the way, but you're not having to do all of the steps in between. So um, it's basically... It's basically like a PDF. You can you can use it if you want. It, uh, a ton of people got a load of value from it, and it will show you how to set up that system for yourself. So it's at amazingfba.com forward slash blueprint. Excellent. Yeah, well, we'll get that set up uh, as soon as the, the podcast is live. So excellent. Thank you, Aaron. It's, it's been excellent stuff. I mean, really, um, it's a bit of therapy for me on, on an example of me messing up the outsourcing thing. But I just think... Uh, that was just an example of where I know damn well from doing it well that it does work if you articulate the the value of your team um, to your team rather of where you want to go, what's important to you, what is important to not do, 
uh, what the outcomes are, having done that sometimes and sometimes failed to, the difference is really extremely big. So I think your, mm -hmm. what you've articulated today is really important for people to hear and, and to go away and reflect on. And if nothing else, to track your time, as you say, again, it, it's a tough discipline, but it's, it's so, so revealing, so incredibly rewarding. Um, Absolutely. So fantastic message and, and clear, actionable stuff as well. So really valuable and um, great to have you on. Thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure as always, Michael. Uh, hopefully it was helpful and uh, anyone needs help whatsoever, just reach out. I'd be more than happy to uh, point you in the right direction. Great. Thanks, Aaron, very much.